Hey everyone, it's Joe Lyons here from Dallas. Yeah, and Jackie from Copenhagen, Denmark. Yeah. Hey. Um, things are heating up here. I don't know about in, in Denmark. It's always so fun to listen to the different weather, but um, we, we got the AC turned on there. It's, it's probably still, are you in shorts yet? Uh, I'm actually in shorts. Yeah. Oh, nice. Um, but but still, it's not many iron shorts yet. You always yeah. say it's also probably freezing compared to what I would call, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I I know we uh, outside it's probably about freezing now, but it gets to and of course this is Celsius, so ten twelve during the day, and that's a bit cold for me to wear yeah. shorts. But yeah, yeah. sixteen, uh, most most people would be uh, thinking about shorts. At least. Okay. Cool. Awesome. All right. So today we were going to um, discuss basically some of the different options you have for uh, web scraping. And so automating web browsers actually, and we're not going to talk about it, but just because it's tangentially related um, API calls, you know, instead of web scraping, but just to throw that out there of like, I always like to mention that when you're thinking about web scraping, at least consider using API calls. Um, and maybe that should be our next one because there's def definitely different topics in that we can talk to of ways you can use API calls to, to get data. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I know everyone's favorite browser is IE11. It's it's a wonderful browser, it's fast and reactive. Um, and I'm, I'm being very sarcastic because it's one of the things, I know Jackie, we've talked about so many times, you know, it's one of the first conversations you start talking to someone and like, oh, you can you can automate the great, yeah. So what do you you can do with Chrome? Well, you know, usually with Auto Hockey we use IE. Oh no, I I won't use IE. Like, well, look, when you're using IE, you're not really browsing with it, right? You're automating the web page, and it really doesn't matter. But um, yeah, it's everyone's joy, and you know, it's weird. I'd say like a year or two ago. I really was concerned that using IE 11 was going to, it seemed to sites were really slowing down and having problems. And I, I was more and more having problems, but honestly, in the last year, I, I haven't run into the same headaches. I don't know if people changed how they're developing or what. Um, have you had any experience like that, Jackie? Or? Yeah, I've had the same experiences and, and with IE 11, I've, I've generally had a good experience. Not, not that I've used it extensively for browsing myself, but, at work, it's the standard browser that is yes. recommended yeah. IT-wise, but still yeah. as, as soon as people say, oh, why is this page not loading? Are you using Chrome? No, they right. weren't. Okay, right. so so kind of like, mm, that's, that's a little weird. And a few of our recent tools have even said uh, this will only yeah. work in Chrome. Yeah, or Firefox so, maybe, right? I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe, Chrome. but yeah, Chrome is at least two of them are um, uh, only uh, Chromium based browsers mm -hmm. will work. But yeah, not not much has been seen, and that won't still work in IE in some way. Yep. So, um, actually, in, in somewhat on topic, um, we had a client the other day that um, I was I was helping them with some, getting some data from the website and they, they were one of those who were like, well, can we do this in Chrome? Um, and we're gonna get to, cause you can, you can automate some stuff in Chrome uh, with, with Auto Hotkey. But what um, Maestrieth had, uh, what I thought was just a brilliant idea was instead of having the client browse with IE, he just created an ActiveX window with the GUI that we were using. And so all they saw, they saw, you know, it was still IE really doing the work, but they didn't yeah. see IE. They just saw the GUI with the web page, you know, and doing stuff. And it negated the whole issue, right? They didn't know yeah. what they're browsing with. And and I'm like, holy cow, that I never thought about that, but that's a great way to just skirt the issue entirely. Yeah, exactly. And I've used it myself a few times at least. So yeah. And it's the same if you want to make HTML GUIs and all of that stuff with without a hotkey, you, you use almost the same thing. And I, I can't remember if it's Triton 7 or whatever it is Windows has that you yeah. actually use for, for that. But but still, it it works quite well if you actually tell it to use the newest um, uh, code base. 
So, and and you can kind of force that. So, right. Yeah. Um. And to circle back, though, you know, at some point, and that's why I was trying to look up right here. I, I think it's twenty twenty five. Um. That so, of course, IE eleven is in Windows ten, and um, Windows has has said Microsoft has said they'll support it until the end of Windows ten is done. Um, and that, I think, does it sound right, Jackie, around 2025, somewhere in there? Uh, I believe that Microsoft said that Windows 10, did, does that even have an end date? Isn't it what? I, I can't remember which yep. date they actually said, but at, at least seven has the extended time. Isn't that to 2025, seven? I, I looked at, I didn't see on the, the window I pulled up, but regardless, I remember we looked into this like two years ago because mm -hmm. we were asking about it and it was it was some distance out right yeah it was like uh nothing to be overly concerned about at the moment um yeah because xp has just ended their extended support right gotcha so, right so so we're on the extended version of seven and that would will last some time but i just told so today on some some youtube tech channel tech link i think it was called where they actually flagged the news that the new version of Edge that will use the Chromium yep. uh, web kit um, will actually have a compatibility mode where you can switch to IE. Oh, interesting. So, hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, for all those that had that has that need. Yeah. And, and that, since you brought up Edge, um, here's the big thing about Edge that, that we learned um, couple of years ago or a year, whatever, somewhere a while ago, that Edge doesn't have a calm backbone to connect to, no. right? Um, however, I remember you and I were playing with this a little bit. Um, it does have an API for connecting to it. And mm -hmm. so we wouldn't necessarily be driving it the same way we do with calm, but theoretically we should be able to drive Edge um, in similar ways of like we do IE 11. Yeah, and my thought is that if it's going to go over to the Chromium-based uh, yep. kit, you can probably use Greek, Geek Dude's um, Chrome uh, class, yep. for, or at least some kind of, of um, extended version of that or modified version. Yeah, yeah. I actually exchanged a few, e I think it was emails or maybe it was on Discord, I can't remember, uh, with him. And he, he said the same thing. He thought it shouldn't be a problem to extend it out to Chromium once it, or, uh, um, sorry, Edge once it's been um, merged over with Chromium. Um, yeah. and which which also, that's a great segue into the whole Geek Dudes Chrome class, which I've played with some. Um, the, the biggest difference for me, what one is you have to launch it in debug mode, which who cares? You just make sure your shortcut launches in that. Uh, but the big one for me was it's using what's the, the um, it the syntax more relies on the query selector and query selector all I, I believe instead of like the get elements by ID and get elements by tag name and this and that okay you can still what I ended up doing just because I know those other ones by by tag name class name and ID you know inside and out um, I wrote a couple wrappers for his class to inject JavaScript and then use those um, methods. And and that worked fine with my testing. Um, again, I don't actually overall use it because I still just automate with IE because it's so easy. But um, I was glad to see that I was able to to use those to um, use use the old methods inside Chrome um, things. It's It wasn't at least yet, it's not as robust as a com object with IE, um, but it, I was doing the stuff I wanted to do. Yeah, and and I I haven't actually read much of of the the, the Chrome class source code, but from what I did reckon at one point is I think it's using sockets to 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 connect and and send commands back and forth and stuff like that. So so yeah, the exposed API there is of course what you, what you are limited by and if other people then just do actually went in and and tried to do something with this um 
maybe some of those things could be extended and, and yeah. become uh, more or less um, available. So yeah, just like you did with your wrappers of injecting JavaScript, no. and and maybe you can actually access that in 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 other ways. Well, or the uh, the other option though is of course I just get off my butt and actually learn the query selector all syntax because the syntax itself is simple. It's just remembering, you know, what character represents class because it still can use class name and ID and tag name. It's just they have their own little abbreviations for them, and you know I just didn't learn them. It's kind of interesting because I remember back when I started learning to check to the uh, automate IE back in 12 or something like that. Yeah. Most of the stuff I found online about IE and uh, the query selectors and stuff like that had kind of like mm, dispatched kind of maybe this will not be how we'll do it in the future kind of feel and, and, and read to it. And then this, <laughs> where where that's that's the way you um, have the best option of controlling Chrome. So that's that's kind of interesting. Right. That um, two steps forward and one step back, or whatever yep. you say. Yep. Even though those can be more powerful, most absolutely. Likely. Yes, I agree with it. Is it's it was part of the thing of why it's more confusing. Because it's it, it does it, I think it is more powerful. You can nest things, really structure them, uh, but again, you have to you got to know your stuff, right? And yeah. um, it's just often I don't need that level, and so it, it's why I use the IWB two learner tool instead of using the built in developer tools. Is I can stay focused just on these couple things, and that's all I really need. And more the, off than not, that is all I need. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. I, I'd say because of the lack of um, the IE learner tools uh, at some some places, um, I ended up using the developer tools more. Uh -huh. Just because I, then I was stranded on some computer where I didn't have access to all my right. normal uh, tools right. and, and then slowly got to learn that, hey, these developer tools got built out more and more. And, yeah. and uh, those were also the ones that actually started me down that path of backwards engineering, which calls were actually made behind the scenes and stuff like that, which which has turned out to be quite powerful to actually yes. understand the Absolutely. traffic that, that the internet is sending back and forth. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and the, actually one you mentioned, and I, we'll save it for the API call, but what was it like three weeks ago, roughly, we were talking about something and you have, you mentioned something at the end of our conversation and thankfully I'm smart enough to say like, I didn't really understand what you said, you know, you, because I'm like, say, say that again. And it was the, the XML HTTP request one that you could literally connect to, I guess the blend of the two, right? Cause you're connecting to the active IE window and from that window, you're sending the API request instead of from the HTTP object itself. And so all the security and everything from your logged in, right? As far as the browser, you're, I'm sorry, the server you're connecting to knows, it's from that browser. Um, and so it negates a bunch of dealing with, you know, uh, OAuth stuff, which drives me insane. Yeah, yeah, true. You you can actually send H, yeah, HTTP request just as if you were the actual user on the site, just as if you'd click the button that would send a request to the server. Instead of actually clicking any kind of button, you can connect to that object yeah. and uses, use it as, as you would any other um, hotkey object to do all of the, the backward or the the background uh, yeah. communication, yeah. Yeah, and, and that was why I brought up API calls earlier was, which ties in great with your mention of looking at the traffic, right? And and that's where, for me, I was behind you in time-wise, but I've gotten to where I, I don't even try to do my normal web scraping anymore and clicking buttons and stuff. I start looking at that traffic and see if I can mirror or you know create that traffic on its own because it's just so much more efficient, faster, and, and often easier. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and of course, we both started at a place where, okay, what can I do with this web page? 
I can get it a source. I can um, oh. um, download uh, URL to file. That's probably one of the places we have both yeah. started. Yeah. And that you would have this enormous uh, amount of uh, HTML stored in a file and you would red exit to death until you got what you were trying to get. And yeah. then we found out this other stuff where you can actually use the built-in browser and navigate in a structured way. And now we are kind of in, in uh, merge those two together. Kind of like we want to get to the rawest part, uh, the, the cleanest version of yeah. uh, almost going around the, the browser. But because the uh, download URL to file uh, has issues with uh, current sessions and cookies yeah. and logins and all that stuff, using the browser to get around that and then just getting uh, that raw data and working with that instead of having it all load in the browser and interacting with it and all that stuff. It, it really has moved uh, us along. Uh, yeah, and to add on to that, because so there's two things. One is, hey, if you're doing any sort of web scraping at all um, that we're talking about, make sure you, you study the DOM, right? It's, it, I, I still remember the one post and I can pull it up probably in a heartbeat but I was trying to do some web scraping and you, this is when we didn't know each other, right? Um, I think you knew probably my tag name or something, right? But mm -hmm. we didn't, we weren't talking. And uh, you're like, well, just do this and loop over and get the each cell from the table. And it was like TD and TR for the rows. Yeah. And uh, to exactly what you said earlier, I used to, I could grab the table and then I would do a regex and try to parse out the things I want instead of grabbing them individually. And I can't tell everyone what a game changer that little insight. Um, first, I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? Like, what What do you mean there's a table and there's these cells? Because I knew I didn't know HTML at all. And that um, suddenly opened up my eyes to like, there's this whole other world that just because it's not listed on the forum, you know, it's it's still there. You, you got to study the DOM and understand the structure. Um, the DOM is a document object model uh, for the web page. And, um, Man, there are so many great ways to pull stuff. Um, it's amazing. Um, and I had a second one, which I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, um, getting back to with what you were describing, uh, the difference being the API call. And of course, a browser loading a page is an API call as well, right? But what Jackie alluded to earlier was when you load that page, you know, you're probably only interested in like 2% of the actual data that comes back right it's there's so much other junk in crap especially in the html and all of this stuff more often than not when you start looking at this stuff there's a little bit of either xml or json data that gets piped into that and man that's when you can start just grabbing that data straight away with the the api call we mentioned with the especially the xml http request one whatever it's called mm -hmm. um, the amount of data you're getting is so tiny and everything is so much faster and concise it's it's crazy. It's so much more efficient. Yeah, and it's kind of what I don't know if it's the for, forefront of what people are doing in, in in web design now, but it is kind of like present the website to people quickly, uh -huh. and then load in whichever kind of data needs to be updated. Yeah, on excellent the point. Way. Yeah, and and so so it's kind of like if you can find those extra small pieces of getting extra data from the server that the developer has made himself. Uh, they often have an entire API behind the scenes that they use to present the data for you yep. in the quickest way possible with the lowest load on their own server. And, and by simply backtracking what the browser is doing when you navigate it normally, you sometimes have uh, um, a good uh, option for getting that specific value that you want from yep. the server instead of from the website. Yep. So, yeah. yeah, case in point, not that Jackie and I did this like three years ago because it's against our policies, so we would never do it. But um, I was playing with the LinkedIn API at the time, which was much more robust and open, and yet it didn't allow for certain things. And then <laughs> We started looking at a web page. Not that we didn't do this, but we looked at the web page, and um, 
we actually were looking at the traffic and wait a minute here we we saw one of these things and we're like well maybe we can stimulate that for like let's pretend it's different companies or people whatever and sure enough we could get exactly what we wanted um, that wasn't actually even available in their public api that you can have access to and uh again it's just like wow there's there's stuff out there that they don't even tell you in their own documentation or api that hey it's available um so it's, it's a great way yeah an, an undocumented feature that was kind of obvious when when you were looking at it uh, and by a, a little trial and error we, we quickly found out that it was uh, truly available and uh, yeah yep. so the, the the last one at least at the top of my head here is uh selenium is another um tool that you can use and I, I did a fair amount of videos and training on it, I'd say like two years ago, somewhere in there. It, um, it also uses predominantly, it, and I know Jackie and I have talked about this uh, offline, but they, they wrote like their own methods. It's, it's not the normal um, get element by ID and tag, they kind of changed some of the syntax, just I don't know if they thought they wanted to be cool or what, but um, it was, it, to me it was pretty annoying. But um, the fact that I could, I could automate um, Edge, I could automate Chrome, I could automate IE and Firefox, and I think Opera, um, all of them with Selenium um, mm -hmm. was, was really um, pretty impressive. Uh, and I haven't used it in quite a while because basically I switched over to Geek Dudes. If I do anything in Chrome, I just use Geek Dudes Chrome class and it's just more direct and I'm not using these weird methods that um, to me were a little odd. Yeah, and it, it, I think that Selenium was kind of like all the, the browsers were in the beginning. I wanted it to do it one way and Netscape wanted it to do it in another way. And then you had Firefox and you had Chrome and all of those others that I can't even remember anymore yeah. um, that all wanted it wanted to implement it in whatever way they, right. they felt like. And I don't know if it was the JavaScript or whichever part of the big uh, consortium of um, HTML and all that stuff that that kind of finalized how it it should look most of the time. And to yes. me, at least, coming in from where we are at now, and and having almost the same things available in all the browsers. We're spoiled. Makes, yeah, I get it. <laughs> It makes a lot of sense to us, at least, and we're, we're, I don't know when Selenium started or or by what background they did it, yeah. but yeah, yeah, the idea of people extending or, or building their own on top of, uh, right. our, um, I think was, we, we in AutoHotKey had some uh, tries at making auto hotkey work in in more than one os and again you had to rethink the entire syntax to to be able to do something like that because mm. the way commands are named and the way that commands are used and stuff like that is still only pointed to how windows and and microsoft developers thought it up at one point mm -hmm. and as soon as you move on to any other kind of os they thought about the same things in a different way so well yeah naming conventions and all that stuff has to be something else so as soon as you get to a language that is multi-platform they have called their stuff their own thing because yeah. it doesn't really matter if it's called what they call it in Windows or in Mac or whatever, because it doesn't make sense to, it's just what you're doing in that one language. Yeah. And I think that's the same for Selenium. Kind of instead of trying to find naming conventions that work in all kinds of browsers, they just made their own. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. yeah in my understanding, I, I don't agree with you. I don't know how law old, Selenium is how long it's been around and its architecture and stuff, but um, I, I I believe it's used a lot by companies that are doing what's it called regression testing and whatnot. But mm -hmm. basically checking, helping companies that develop web pages check to see if everything is working the way they think it is across different types of browsers and different types of tablets, you know, devices and everything, um, yeah. and automating the process. Right. Um, yeah. yeah. Sounds about right. Yeah. 
and and that's probably the thing, right? They want their functions to work in all types of, of browser instances. Uh -huh. And instead of choosing to call it what IE called it, they just chose to call it their own thing. Yeah. So, yeah. Now, um, I'm curious because it's still related to this topic overall, but we, we talked about before we would get someone to ask us for some help with web scraping. We say, sure, we can, we can look at that. And then we go there and it's a flash website. Right, yeah. which, which I know we talked about, I forget when, but it wasn't that long ago where we both agreed it's, it's super rare nowadays to come up to a Flash website. Um, but what I didn't think through was do other tools like Python, what is it, Beautiful Soup, and there's another one, uh, a library for web scraping, and as well as Selenium, like are those able to, to peek inside and grab stuff? Is it auto hockey that can, or do you think all of them had issues with Flash? I think all of them had some kind of issue with Flash because the way, and I don't know much about Flash, but how how I believe it worked was it was kind of like doing everything in the background and then just presenting a finished rendered image for mm -hmm. you. So So it didn't have like, it could have, but I don't know, but not like Windows where a window is actually built of multiple different okay. um, elements, uh, one for the button and one for the uh, input field and one for, no, 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 it, is, it was told you need to have all these elements mm -hmm. and then it would render it and then just give you a finished image of, of that. And that makes it very hard to actually work with. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we're we're spot on on time. And uh, this, is there anything else we should cover on this? I think we got a lot of good stuff in here. Yeah. Yeah. We, we did. It's great. Cool. All right. Well, I'll see you next week, and we'll. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Take Bye. care. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>